Welcome to Tales from the Gutter. For the month of October, we are focusing each week on a specific type of horror or spooky comic. This week, we're focused on foreign horror comics. To start this discussion, we each read Beautiful Darkness by Fabian Fellman and Curious Goat and translated by Helga da- Dasher, sorry if I mispronounced anything, Bong Xiang Dong Ghost by Ho Rang, and The Enigma of Amigara Fault by Junji Ito. I'm Kaylee Fleeman. I'm Karotron 2000. And I'm Kit DeForge. So to start, we're going to talk about Beautiful Darkness, which is French, right? Mm-hmm. Yes. Uh, and it was translated to English um, not too terribly long ago, if I'm not mistaken. If I was more organized, I would have written this down. Um, if only we had magic and- things. They did uh, Drawn and Quarterly recently released it, I think, in like the last like three years. Okay, yeah, like that's, that. that's what I thought. Yeah. I remember I heard it, it about came out it not too oh, long ago. Yeah, well, I heard about it the best comics of 2014. Yeah. So, okay. That was, I would assume it came out in 14, but that. Or at least the translated version. Did. Yeah. Okay. Um, I didn't so, bring it because I'm a dummy. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you were the one that turned me on to this comic to begin with and also turned Kit onto it. Oh my god, you did. Uh, <laughs> you absolutely Whoa. turned me <laughs> on to it. No, uh, I'm not even shy about how much I liked that. Um, so do you want to kind of introduce it? Uh, yeah, so Beautiful Darkness um, kind of caught my eye because I was reading the best comics of 2014, I think on Comics Alliance or something. And I thought that it just looked really cute, but, every, but the description was like, this is a dark tale discussing dark things and it's scary. And I was like, huh, that's interesting. And then I kind of do this thing sometimes with comic books where I kind of obsess over them until I read them because I want to know what it is. And so I wasn't really sure what to think of it. And I tried using my usual avenues of finding the comic, but I couldn't. And then I tried to find it like in comic stores and I couldn't. So I ended up buying it off Amazon because I couldn't sleep. That's not true. But I kept thinking about it. I was curious about it. So that's what happened. But um, essentially, it's a story about a cute little princess, and she has a cute little polka dot dress, and she's just kind of trying to keep everybody together, but everybody's kind of stupid, and, like, (laughs) they don't really, like, realize what they're doing sometimes, and she's, she kind of goes rogue at the end, and, like, decides that she doesn't need them anymore, and finds like kind of her own way of doing things after kind of becoming really frustrated with her situation. Yeah, it's it's weird because the the character designs are so cute. Um and everything about this comic is really cute. It's a little it, gross. Uh, a little gross. There's some gross parts. Um but then there are scenes where the characters act horribly. Like downright atrociously like ripping each other limb from limb awful horrific things but with these very cute cartoony miniature bodies <laughs> and it is a really weird like juxta- juxtaposition of these two type of um oh my god there's a word i'm looking for aesthetics that one mm-hmm. um where you have like that that cute cartoony thing, which I think you get in a lot of French comics, or at least a lot of the French comics I've read, kind of follow this certain style of cartooning when they have, when they're going for a cartoony style, they follow a very specific sense of how they cartoon, if that makes sense. Like, um, I feel like American comics kind of run the gambit because they take and pull from all different types of cultures and styles and stuff. And French has a very specific flavor to me. Um, so you have these very specific, very cutesy cartoons, but doing the things that you would only see in a, a horror comic. And I just found that really interesting. And this book is not a very long read, but a lot happens in it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's a lot, like, it's very minimalistic when it comes to, like, what 
they're saying because I think it's more about their actions of mm-hmm. what's do- what's going on. Like, yeah, just kind of like you see the evolution of kind of how hor- it's it's not even that they're doing horrible things. It's just like they're horrible little people. Like, yeah, you- I think I think what it is, though, is that they're childlike. But I don't think it's so much that they're horrible people. I felt like at least when I was reading it, it kind of smacked of the kind of childish vindictiveness that you get before you teach children morality. Like when kids are really little, a lot of things are just action and reaction until you establish certain like moral or ethical boundaries. And it seemed like a lot of the cases with these little characters were just like, well, this person did this and that made me angry or I want this, so I'm just going to take it. Um, Like an example being they had that little baby doll kind of character, says she's hungry, picks up the nearest person to her that's smaller, just pops her right in her mouth. Mm -hmm. And what I found really interesting about that is that by using these kind of childlike images, I think there was something being conveyed about how we perceive innocence as this innately good thing when often there's like an ethical ignorance that comes along with it that until someone comes along and says hey that's awful it it is kind of horrifying to think that that's not the default setting when Mm -hmm. when you're young that you don't you aren't born understanding what's right and what's wrong i think is what they kind of were going with like these little bitty people and these really sweet looking people and you know cute little images and everything but doing these really atrocious things because there's really nothing that guides them. Like there's no real one leader that is like, you know, like leading by example. They have like the princess, for example, but she has no interest whatsoever in guiding or helping any of these other characters. She's just more about being the princess. And it felt to me like that kind of schoolyard thing that you have where you let kids loose on the playground in like kindergarten and stuff. And there's this weird way that They may try to form a society, but there's always these odd little power struggle things like, well, I'm the queen or, you know, this I'm the queen because I said I was the queen and we're playing pretend and none of these things have any sort of reality to us. So there are no consequences. And I think that's what made it scariest is that there would be really real consequences like crawling up in the nest and that bird, you know, but nobody would react to them. Because mm-hmm. there was nobody there to interpret consequence for them. It was just like, oh, well, they're dead. Anyway, next panel. And I think mm-hmm. that's what makes it kind of a horror comic, kind of creepy mm-hmm. that there's no yeah. boundaries. Yeah. And uh, towards the end, the um, but is, is it just Princess or is her name Dottie? I think it's like Aurora. No, it's Aurora. Aurora is the one oh, in the yeah. spotted dress and then oh, okay. the princess was... Something I can't remember. I thought Aurora was a princess. <laughs> There's that other girl, though, that steals her man. Yeah. Yeah. Dude. Which is rude. Yeah, it's really rude um, of her to do. Ba- the, basically, the, the main character, the, the girl in the spot dress, whose name I'm totally blanking on right now. Is it Aurora? I'm pretty sure it's Aurora. Okay. Yeah. Um, I feel like she kind of l- learns the idea of morality but in a very twisted sense uh at the end Mm -hmm. but i i don't know it was it was uh it was definitely a read that even though it was short and even though the art was very cute it it sticks with you for a long time yeah and you think about like i first read it i think almost a year ago now the the Mm -hmm. first time i read it and I constantly find myself like going back and thinking about it in a way that not a lot of other comics have made me do. I I think um, as far as scenes and things sticking or sticking along, um, Kirby, I think I commented to you on how uncomfortable it made me that with one of the characters, they just stuck her in a pencil case and buried her alive. Um that later on when a character dies and they need to bury them um, only because they're important to this one person because it's it's kind of remarkable when they do care that someone dies, mm-hmm. um, that they have the same pencil case. 
And I thought it was so, for some reason, that was so creepy to me to think that like, well, they went back and got the same pencil case. And I, of course, as an adult, I'm thinking about like what's appropriate. And so I'm stopping and going, well, what did they do with the other body? Did they just dump it? Like, and, and again, mm-hmm. with these really childish images, you start feeling weirdly guilty for thinking about consequence in a bizarre sort of way because you're looking at it and you're going like, well, where'd the other body go? Yeah. Do they even care? You know, and then, and then again, this adultness of like, well, don't they know what's appropriate? And you kind of go, well, I guess they don't, which is why I think it feels a little bit like reading it is like, kids pulling wings off a butterfly Mm -hmm. is that you want to go and correct them and be like no that's not what you do that's wrong Mm -hmm. but at the same time you're just kind of horrified by the capacity they have for doing these bad things when you just take away the concept of consequence or guilt um and yeah i don't know that i think for me is what made it such an interesting book is having beautiful images like that with just no morality yeah (laughs) yeah Well, I think that kind of Aurora also, it's been a while since I've read it, but um, I remember her kind of seeming like she wants to be kind of the leader of everyone. Like she's the one that's Doing like trying to good. hand out food. She's trying to like get everybody in line being like, okay, well, you know, it's probably time to move on. Maybe we should like do something else or whatever. Yeah. Um, and then she ends up kind of like snapping because nobody is really like taking her seriously that fizz bitch takes her man. And like <laughs> <laughs> she, she ends up like running away with the mice and that I think the scene with the mouse, I think is yeah. what really sticks with me. That makes me like really uneasy. And unfortunately that's the one that always comes to mind when we talk about the book but i think that also kind of plays to how like kind of powerful it was that that's the one scene that kind of sticks with me but i and then she just kind of is like whatever i'll be my own man kind of loses heart with this idea that you should do nice and good things for the sake of doing them and i think one of the reviewers had talked something about um like the the folly of nice for niceness's sake yeah, that, that I she think that's operates her. operates under the, I need to take care of everybody. I need to be good. I need to be nice. But if you don't understand why you're doing it or why it's important or if other people aren't acknowledging it, there is a point that you stop feeling that nurturing or that like kind of like caring feeling. You You eventually just get disheartened and stop. And it's interesting to say that a book, again, that looks like this – would have like such a drastic character transformation and Mm -hmm. you know such little again like borrowers looking people um it's so cute it's It's so so, cute it's it's so so pretty you know the color palette in it too i think is really yeah like i love the color palette in it like it's really pretty i stared at that first like opening splash page like no joke there um after she's having her little tea party and they they crawl out of where they're living. Like I, I stared at that splash page when you handed the book to me for like several seconds. I just didn't, I didn't want to move forward because it was such a gorgeous picture of this little girl, but it was just so grotesque, you know? Mm -hmm. And I always have this odd jealousy for people that can, uh, that can do those beautiful watercolory sort of images like that, that are both realistic and kind of haunting. Um, there, there is no denying that this book is a gorgeous book. Um, I, I would be very interested to be in your position, Kirby, and to hand this book to somebody without really being like, oh, well, this, this is a good book. Like, I'd love to be in the position of handing this book to someone and being like, I'd really like you to read this and have someone, oh, what a beautiful book or like, oh, you know, a little cutesy kind of book, you know. And then their faces slowly go. Yeah, and have them come back to you and be like, what is with you? <laughs> you know? um, and I so read I this think to some, my child. No. <laughs> yeah, well, see, that, that's a funny thing that I wonder a lot about is how many people pick it up initially. And, oh, yeah, it's for children, you know. No. Yeah, I bought I bought it on Amazon. And I was reading the reviews of it because I was like, I bought this really, for my daughter. There was one that was like, I don't know if it was like angry, but I remember reading a review that was like, don't buy this for your kids. <laughs> like I bought it for my daughter and it's a cute princess book, but don't do it. <laughs> like, 
I'm very thankful for Drawn and Quarterly, though, for putting out these kind of books from all over the place. And like you, you guys know that I'm like a crazy huge Moomin fan. And so one of the things when he handed me this book, I was like, oh, it feels like Moomin's. It looks like that. Oh, it's so nice. Um, but thankfully, Drawn and Quarterly does have this investment in these foreign comics that, you know, they think they're worth getting into other people's hands. And I'm I, I can't wait to pick up my copy of this book. Actually, I just, I'd be very proud to have it grace the shelf and hand it to people. It's absolutely beautiful. And then you so. can tell them it's a cute story about a princess. Yeah, a the princess. End. That's it. Don't yeah. don't expect anything else. Uh-huh. Nothing else. Three girls talking about comics. First thing about cute princesses. Mm-hmm. So you know, you know what we all sweet. about. Yeah. Yeah, you know it's sweet. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So yeah, Beautiful Darkness. That's a thing you should read. Mm-hmm. Not it's beautiful. Children. It's a little dark. Yeah, yes. a little bit. Just, just s dark, <laughs> darkness, darkness. <laughs> um. So our next comic is one that's actually kind of become a meme, actually online, um, and it's uh, Bang Xiang, Bang Xiang Dong Ghost by. Ho Rang, um, and it is a Korean webcomic. Just Google Korean horror comic. Yeah. That's the one. Yeah, if you Google Korean horror comic, it will be the first result. Um, it's made a really big impact um, when it first released, and part of that is because of some of the things that the artist does with the medium, which you can really only do given the multimedia sphere of being online. And this comic is very much so a standard ghost story or a standard ghost encounter. But the way that it's written and the way that it's presented is horrifying. And actually... Fun factoid, I was on Facebook today, and because Facebook has those timeline, like, oh, look at all those mistakes that you made a couple years ago, exactly on this day. Um, I was looking through that, and it turns out that exactly four years ago was the first time that I read this comic, and my status was, oh my god, you guys, I just read a comic, and it scared me so much, I started crying. Um, So you, you all know how much uh, fortitude I have when it comes to horror. Um, But yeah, this is, it's really good just in, in its presentation and in the way that it's set up, I guess. Um, Kit, did you have any thing that you wanted to say about it? Yeah. um, I, I wanted to throw a little bit where this, uh, this artist did do a couple of other kind of stories of a similar type. Um, We get the name uh, Bong Chiang um, from a neighborhood in South Korea. And so I guess they went on to do a couple stories with this similar kind of ghost um, about different people encountering them. Um, In this case, I think around like a train station was another one of them. Um, and just in general, I, I'm a big fan of, of all kinds of horror, but I'm always interested in, um, different Asian horror movies and things. And there's this huge bent to where urban legend is a a critical part of what makes these sort of stories scary, I think, to, to Westerners, because the image of the ghost is very, very different um, in a lot of, of different Asian countries. Um, for example, in, in Japan, you'll have the kind of, uh, like the yokai kind of ghosts and stuff, which made famous by the ring with these really long, dark hair sort of things, like slow moving, um, unhappy and, you know, more lurky, I think, than our, our common, uh, our, our ghosts have gotten, I guess, in popular culture in America. They're very different. Um, so many of the ghosts and the urban legends about ghosts in Korea and Japan are centered largely around uh, suicides and 
and just the impact of suicide. And I think it's kind of interesting to tie this into our previous reading with um, Beautiful Darkness is the idea of these kind of morality tales that happen from fairy tales. You know, in, in Beautiful Darkness, it's presented in this kind of little fairy tale sort of way, this playful kind of way. But usually your fairy tales teach you something to do or not do. And our first book, that's not the case. You know, they, they weren't teaching you to be good and be nice and everything will work out. Then you kind of jump into this particular comic and a lot of these urban legends are more about the impact of of suicide or this this innate fear of like the monster that people become because of things like this. Um, so many of them, I think, seem to be targeted particularly to students for a reason. Um, the The Japanese horror comics and the Korean horror comics that are appearing online um, in the past couple of years, uh, a lot of them are about integrating digital media into telling these stories and they become these odd modern modern morality tales or modern like urban legends and it's easy to dismiss something like this as just about scaring you and that's it but i also like to kind of look at it i guess from a cultural perspective of um why why are so many of these young kids making these things too <laughs> i guess like the, the cultural fears that people may have um in in the case of uh bong chung ghost bong chung dong ghost <laughs> <laughs> um i i'm just really interested in how the spread of these things ha is being covered too just in the media as this sort of scare tactic thing we we have similar moral panics in the united states about horror or about video games or things like that and in japan what they're contending with a lot is is these different viral things on the net um i think i spoke with you a little bit kaylee about um about the sasebo slasher about how there was this case in Japan of this little girl who was like 10 or 11 years old who was a big fan of this horror game called Red Room. And then she went about and um, after being teased on the internet for her weird interests in this kind of horror stuff, she slashed her classmate's throat after being teased. And so the Japanese media kind of grabbed her interest in these horror things and found uh, Red Room, which is an interactive horror comic, and did the thing that we do in the West and kind of goes, hey, well, see, that's why she's violent. That's why she did these things. Um, and so I don't know. Like I, I look at, at something like this and wonder how much of it is young people being interested in these things that are forbidden to them. Or acknowledging the darker sides of their society, um, particularly like with this this case of the babies and the suicide, um, and in the um, Bong Chang Dong Ghost, um, especially when you get into the train one. <laughs> mm -hmm. I don't know. That's a kind of long winded way of saying. I look at these things and I kind of go, "Whoa, what are we afraid of?" You know. Yeah. What, what things are scaring us most in our world? And I think it's a big problem in Korea that they're dealing with things like infant mortality and suicides and things like that and, and these immense societal pressures. You well, know. it's interesting to me, too, um, at least in most of the media that I consume, the ghosts, uh, like Western ghosts are usually the victims of murders more mm -hmm. commonly than not. Um, mysteries. Yeah, they're usually, yeah. they're usually they're mysteries, um, or they're, they know who murdered them and they're angry. Um, or even, even if they were driven to suicide, it's the fault of a particular person. Um, there, there's often somebody outside of the ghost to blame, or at least somebody that the ghost blames, however right or wrong they might be. And I have noticed, especially getting prepared for this discussion, that in a lot of like Japanese and Korean comics, this is not the case. Usually a lot of the ghosts are 
suicides or people who like died on accident but still wanted to die um and i i find that interesting that that was sort of like that was a huge difference i noticed a lot of it's fueled by regret like in these stories so many of these stories in urban legends about ghosts regret is such a huge theme Mm -hmm. in it you know regret with either how you spent your life or the things you lost in it or the decision to take your life and um I also have to say, you know, again, the, the image of the ghost, very, very different in in these, uh, like the Asian ghost stories. This one, there's a, there's a lot of bleeding mm-hmm. in, um, well, in general with, with like the Korean and Japanese ghosts. But uh, once you read this one, you'll kind of see what we mean is like um, uh, Horang, like very gory ghosts you know you western you think of pale and sad and we don't do the whole chain rattling thing anymore mm-hmm. but we should i i call bringing that back yeah but, but there's me. a lot more connection to this whole like like blood and body sort of concept with with these asian ghosts and i i think a lot of the the scare factor in these foreign stories for western audiences is just the novelty just the idea that that's not what you think of when you think of a ghost. Our, our ghosts sometimes you can see depicted in Western media as suffering from whatever caused their demise. But it's very overt with a lot of the Japanese and Korean ones. They get like the crawling ghosts and things like that with broken legs. Mm-hmm. Or um, you, you get um, a lot of them are, are about... Uh, Related to abortion or loss of babies and there will be, you know, blood on, on gowns or dresses or, you know, um, there's a lot of injuries to the face, too, in, in urban legends for them, like the, the slit mouth woman and things like that. There are so well, many of these. To obscure their face. Yeah. To like hide it, make them mm-hmm. not as human looking, probably. Yeah, you know, and, and I find that really interesting. You can look to way back in depictions of ghosts all the way back to, like, kabuki theater buto and beyond like japanese theatrical tradition will go really far back and you will still see these same sort of ghosts and images um so if you're ever curious i guess about like paranormal lore in different countries it is really fascinating to look into how korean and japanese media depict their ghosts so I'm really, really hung up on the ghost, guys. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, that's fair. Um, but you'll um, see with our, their ghost in particular in this comic. Like, you can see directly what kind of damage she suffered in her death. Mm-hmm. They're not shy about it. <laughs> so I did want to clarify one thing real quick. So mm-hmm. his name is Ho-Rong? I believe it was Ho-Rong. Yeah. Okay. Because I was trying to figure it out, and I was like... Everything I I saw, it just looked like the whitest possible pronunciation of that name of like Ho Rang. And I was just like, oh, that's probably not right. Oh, I'm in no way fluent in Korean or anything, but like it it looked to me like like Ho Rang. Yeah. I'm like, I have no idea how to pronounce this and I'm going to go with it. But that sounds like the whitest possible, like most butcheriest way to say it. No, I'll and admit I'm that sorry. I'm probably guessing this out because what I know of a little tiny bit of knowledge of Chinese and then studying Japanese is that your A sound, you don't get A. It's you get A, E, U, A, O in uh, Japanese. And so I find that it, when I hear a lot of Korean words, I hear like ah, you, a, o. Okay. But that makes sense. Don't quote me. I am not a Korean speaker <laughs> in any fluent way. That's just my guess at it. So okay. I'm no more an authority. I'm sorry than if anyone. I mispronounced the name. No, I don't think you did. I don't, I don't mm-hmm. know. I mean, he's going Korean to Korean speakers. I uh, could. <laughs> Rami, if you're somehow listening, feel free to just rain down upon me from <laughs> Nebraska, wherever you are right now. <laughs> so. She's in the Air Force. Maybe she'll fly down. And... Mm-hmm. Anyway. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and our final comic uh, is by an artist who we knew we wanted to talk about his work in particular. And we had a hard time trying to land on one short enough comic that would kind of highlight his work, um, but allow us to talk about 
all of his other work. Um, so this is as much a discussion of the comic Enigma of Amigara Fault as much as it is a discussion of the artist and writer Junji Ito. Um, so Enigma of Amigara Fault uh, begins with these holes being discovered in this fault line after an earthquake. And they are people-shaped. And a bunch of people come down to these holes and they feel like these holes are calling their names and they want to go into these holes. And uh, it's a really... This is not the type of story that you would see in a Western comic. I, I really don't. I, I feel like you would not see it. Um, and so this is a really interesting concept. And it's also kind of indicative of a lot of the other work that Junji Ito does. And I know Kit is much more of an expert on his work than I am. Because I've only just recently started reading uh, things by him, honestly. I am gross body horror trash. Um, just to throw this out there, um, I remember spending one Halloween season with my friend Kelsey um, getting, back in the day, you'd get the discs for Netflix in the mail, um, trying to get together as many Asian horror movies and things as we could and then reading into as many you know manga as we could on that. Um, one of the things we hit upon that caused me to read Junji Ito was uh, Tetsuo, the Iron Man. And Tetsuo is mostly a body horror story that involves a person who's hit by a car and then pulling bits of metal out of his skin as he's slowly transforming into, you know, a metal or Iron Man. And I remember watching this thinking, who the hell thinks of this shit? And then I come to find out that body horror is a pretty common theme in a lot of uh, manga, like horror manga, and that the veritable king is Junji Ito. Um, he's he's known for uh, works like Uzumaki is probably his most famous, um, where an entire town is driven to obsession with spirals and uh, enact certain crimes or go mad because of seeing them or wanting to create them. And I remember hearing this and thinking, this is the stupidest, weirdest thing I've ever seen. But you take the most bizarre of concepts with Junji Ito, and he has this amazing ability to make them bizarrely terrifying and also weirdly comic. Um, he did another called Yo, which was about uh, parasitic fish people. <laughs> It's it's vaguely hilarious, but it's that's where he gets into the gross type of body horror rather than scary, um, as I think of it. But I think the two most notable would be this story, um, Amigara Fault, to Western audiences, and also uh, Tomie, which, you know, if you're messing around at the internet at 3.30 in the morning on 4chan or something, <laughs> you run into a lot of weird gross panels by Junji Ito. Um, he was always kind of an odd guy, uh, as he puts it himself. He was inspired to draw horror manga, particularly by the drawings that his sister made when she was young. Like he was really caught up in this idea of how little children see the world and how they see their bodies and themselves. And so a lot of his horror influence was this idea of distortion, um, which I think he does a fantastic job of, particularly in this story. Um, he also worked as a dental assistant. So he's super into this idea of messing with faces and mouths as well. Um, so that's just a little weird background that might color your perception of this book, I guess. Um, he He's also a big fan of H.P. Lovecraft. So that helps. Um, he comes from a similar school as a, a few different mangaka like uh, uh, Hideshi Hino um, and uh, Yatsutaka Tsutsui, um, who were active mostly in like the 70s. And so in establishing what we know of Asian horror, um, 
he he was inspired by the word guinea pig. <laughs> if if you ever want to be grossed out by body horror for the rest of your life, guinea pig. Um, so he he tries to use body horror as a way to reflect how ordinary people um, ordinary people see the world around them and the pressures that they have to try to conform or try to understand the irrational. And how quickly people will break apart in the face of something that is abnormal. Um, Some people embrace it, as is, I think, the case of Amigara Fault. And others just try to break things into their will. So I think uh, it was a good choice to choose Amigara Fault. um, Because it, it, it shows a whole lot about what pressures people would feel in that culture to fit and to conform. And he takes that a very literal direction and sees how people are distorted by expectation or by role. Um, did uh, Kirby, did you with with this one or, hmm. you know, what what did you kind of feel about this? Like people. Oh, you know, I, I didn't quite get again. the people conforming thing. Mm-hmm. that much but um one thing that i did kind of notice with this and other comics that i've read in kind of like the same sort of like vein of being like you know asian or from the orient or whatever is that like the horror doesn't really come with like a monster or um like a ghost or a spirit or anything like it comes from kind of more internally for people like you just had, there's like something and it's calling you and you can't stop. And it's like this insidious sort of like, you have to do this thing and you, you cannot stop it from happening. And, um, one of the other ones, like, um, you know, you're, you're looking on the internet, it's like two in the morning and you don't know, you're like <laughs> in bed on your phone. Cause you have to work tomorrow. And um, <laughs> Cause that's a normal way to spend the night. Yeah. Absolutely. That's how you do. Mm-hmm. But, um, I ran across a comic that I thought was kind of similar to this one. It it also involved holes, but um, it was more about like this schoolgirl, and she had like this rash or something on her. And when she scratched it, she realized that it kind of gave her pleasure. And so um, the more she scratched, the more pleasure she got. And it was like oozing this stuff, and then like the stuff would like get on her and make more holes on her and so she like eventually started just like sticking things all over her because like it was this thing that she felt she had to do and she couldn't stop herself from doing it even though it was like just changing her body and it was like gross and she just like couldn't help herself and so i think that there's kind of like this lean towards being out of control Compulsiveness, is yeah, a really compulsiveness. Huge thing. That's a better. Yeah. I think that's a better word. But it's just like you can't not do this thing, and it's taking over your life, sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Which I think is interesting because I think a lot of American stuff, it's kind of like, oh, they're crazy, or you oh, were, M Night Shyamalan know, twist. Something yeah. happened. To you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Something like it possessed t- them. Right? Yeah, but it's not necessarily that. It's more of like a calling, like. You, it's like this, yeah. Thing the, the people who are caught up in this horrific thing are fully aware of their actions, and could theoretically stop doing whatever it is that's destroying them or others around them, but they won't because they feel compelled to do it. Mm-hmm. Versus um, some pretty common western horror themes where it's well this person is uh only is like a doppelganger of somebody that you care about or is possessed by a demon or you know usually there's some reason yeah Yeah. there's some reason um that they can't stop or that they won't stop doing it that's in some way excusable like you can eventually forgive that person if that like if whatever is causing this action stops but in a lot of eastern horror that's not the case because they're doing it and they are fully aware of what they're doing they just don't want to stop there's this this sad senselessness 
in his mm-hmm. stories. Like there's this kind of feeling that it's inevitable that this thing will be happening in the mind of this person, even though they have, like you said, full control to kind of do something differently. It is a running theme with a lot of Junji Ito's work that certain things are just unstoppable or inevitable. Um, and work, uh, Parasite is one too that is just very largely about what you accept and what you fight. Um, and so commonly, his ordinary people will not fight back, like hardly at all. Um, and there's always maybe one or two rationally minded people in his stories that may try to point out the error of something, but others will just refuse it because it's almost like they prefer to accept the unusual rather than admit that there is something stronger than them, that it's easier to go along than it is to fight. Mm-hmm. Um, and in in the case with Amigara Fault, I think what's oddest and most shocking about it is how logical people are about being like, no, 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 like this is just not a thing. Why are you doing this? But how there are just as many, sometimes if not more people that will show up and be like, oh, I've totally ridden this irrational thought and it makes sense. Like people seeing these holes on the television and being like, that one looked just like me. And being Mm -hmm. like, oh, well, I know what you mean. I came all the way from some other prefecture to find this hole that's shaped like me. Mm -hmm. And a lot of his horror will not just draw on like the manipulation of the body as the horror, but the idea of the body as a sense of self And how people will put themselves through horrible things as a form of assertion and control over themselves. And it's very strange and very sad to think about that these people are willing to like hurt themselves, warp themselves, do these things as maybe some kind of assertion that they can. Or that with an opportunity presenting itself, why not do it? You know, Mm -hmm. it's... It's really, really bizarre, I think, to us, again, from like a Western lens to see where any of these characters would choose to do these things. Mm -hmm. But I think that's what makes it so horrifying for us is that the preservation and protection and perfection of our bodies is such a huge thing that to turn that on its head where people aren't concerned about that any longer is horrifying to us, you know? Yeah. Absolutely. No, there's definitely a lot of things that are... If if you're looking to be truly unnerved, looking at the horror from regions outside of your own is a great way to put yourself outside of your comfort zone. The sexual Mm -hmm. components in this too, I think. Mm -hmm. That's that's another one that like how we treat sexuality um, is... You know, we're we're very overt about a lot of things about we're overtly sexy in America and Japan similarly will be overt about sexiness, but weird and standoffish and quiet and vaguely ignorant about sexual things. Kirby brought up this comic about, you know, scratching and, and essentially harming yourself and receiving pleasure from it. And that's another thing that you find a lot of in these stories is that feeling something is a a lot of this body horror is that you feel something and even if it harms you that's enough Mm -hmm. the fact that you get to feel something um contrast this again if you want to watch the movie uh, tetsuo there's a lot of him he's he's ripping his skin off in this movie to find these bits of metal and screws beneath and of course we're sitting here cringing going you know you're damaging your body and, and from a core human level, a survival level, we know that that's wrong because we're all about preserving our existence and preserving the shell that we walk around in. But the same character derives immense pleasure from bodily, like, self-mutilation. Um, you, you'll you end up seeing a lot of that in Junji Ito's stuff, like when he does Tomie. A lot of the sexual feelings are pushed into this realm of of personal violence or destructive violence against the people that you feel these things for. Um, And so I I think that some of the best parts of what makes this good horror is that it it fuels the idea of self-control 
and questions it and makes you uncomfortable with the idea of your own control and wonder about what sort of things you might do that damage it, you know, you know, you know that this thing is damaging to you, but what might you do given a strange circumstance or what sort of odd compulsions you have that you might follow? So Ito, I, I'm very fond of. I, I think he's a master of making people uncomfortable. And I know a lot of people don't like that. But I think that's half the reason I respect his work so much is that he likes to make people uncomfortable. And you start learning from those uncomfortable feelings you get. <laughs> mm -hmm. Or asking weird questions about yourself at three in the morning. So... He's, he also did a charming comic about moving into his new place with his cats. So oh. if you, uh, he if just, you're he a felt the need to go under his couch, he just climbed under there and just, stayed there uh, the entire couch, time. This couch was made for me, like these <laughs> holes. You know, <laughs> it's shaped just like me if I lay down. Yeah, it totally. <laughs> if I lay is. down and make myself into the shape of the bottom of this couch. <laughs> Maybe that's the real problem: is that he saw all of his cats, you know, curling up and being able to fit in things with their curvy spines, and just kind of went, "You know what? Why can't I be a spiral? Why mm -hmm. can't I wedge myself into several miles of rock? You know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. just a, it looks cozy. Yeah, <laughs> it's just my size." <laughs> I, I am fascinated by the uh, claustrophobic aspects of this story, especially because it's such a common fear, you know, with people that you talk to. It's, I, told, I don't know anyone who would ever have the impulse to, ah, yes, it's shaped like me and I can't see what's on the other side. Screw it. I'm going to walk right in, you know? Yeah. yeah. Well, not even walk. You shuffle because it's so perfectly fit to you that you can't walk in it. Yeah. Like you just, every time you move, you kind of shuffle a little bit more forward. Do you think it's, oh sorry. Oh no. It's uh, it's horrifying. Like I was reading it and I definitely kind of like I made sure that all my windows were open and I was saying my living room which is like the biggest most open space of my house, and, you know, had to make sure that I had space because reading that I felt so enclosed. I wonder if he ever had the experience of um like an out-of-body experience mm -hmm. or a sleep paralysis experience because that's a case where you're literally in yourself and you can't move that there's this fascination that you're you're conscious and you know where your body is and you're hyper aware of your body but you can't leave it you can't move and you feel trapped i'm i would love to hear what this guy's nightmares are like <laughs> <laughs> i truly would he does i have nightmares yeah he has live mirrors he just rolls over <laughs> rolls over in in bed or you know if maybe his futon and giggles and goes "Ooh, that's one for the dream journal you know just <laughs> jot that down yeah. he has like a dream a dream yeah. <laughs> a dream dictionary he's like yeah. okay today i dreamed about today i dreamed that i was stuck in a hole that was exactly my shape yeah um oh junji <laughs> <laughs> uh anything else that we should bring up. I just want to know how the crap there is a <laughs> hole for every single person, like on the maybe even in Asia, just like on this fault. Like, do they close after the person goes in and somebody new fills in? Yeah, or what? I just, I mean, I know that it's a story, but I mean, if we. Like, are some people kind of like, like if they were to like scurry in like on their stomach, so it's like a smaller hole and it's not taking up as much space or to the side. I mean, yeah. Well, I just, there was the, there was somebody who tried to go into a hole that wasn't theirs. And he uh, couldn't, yeah. he couldn't they, they get very far. He tried to send far. the search party guy yeah. and he couldn't. He, he got, they yeah. think they said like. Uh, they made a point of saying he was 5'2", he was shorter than the hole and they thought yeah. that that would work out. You mm -hmm. Yeah. Know? And yeah. Uh, he only got basically a few feet in and then had to back out because there wasn't enough room for him. While the guy who the hole was made for was, I think they said 30 or 40 meters down within mm -hmm. like minutes. So that was that was interesting. Definitely a bit of supernatural aspect to it. 
Um, I actually, I was just peeking at this out of curiosity, too. Apparently, he did an incredibly faithful adaptation of Frankenstein, and now I really super want to read that. Um, And Kirby, Hmm. world's biggest Pokemon fan in my life, he did a chapter of the Pokemon comic, uh, weird as that sounds. Oh, my Um, gosh. But we we did find that article a bit ago about how he was going to, he was originally going to do the Silent Hills comic. Not Silent Hill, but Silent Hills, a, mm-hmm. an expansion of the Silent Hill universe. Silent Apparently Hill that didn't happen More because hills. they didn't want my dreams to become yeah, reality. Yeah, because they don't mm. like people to be happy. Yeah, and by happy, I mean like sobbing in my blankets and going, this is good. This I is never so want to leave scary. my house again. This I don't want to. So yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 No. That's good. No, this this month, um, for those who don't know, I like I love horror as a concept which is a part of why we're doing this show because i really 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 wanted to talk about horror i'm also a giant baby um the first time i watched the haunted mansion i was like 13 years old and i had nightmares for two weeks um yes the disney movie and i watched screen queens last night the first episode and i couldn't do my laundry because it's down in my dark basement that for some reason the porch light has gone out on so there's no light around it whatsoever it's like well because we don't have cell phones with flashlights no it doesn't matter because you know (laughs) you know who dies first the flashlight the dumb girl with a flashlight and i am that girl (laughs) well if you have a cell phone (laughs) um but yeah so this this has been a, a rough month for me (laughs) <laughs> there's so, so many nightmares saying. i can share with you <laughs> my lord yeah but no it's it's good i i love being scared um i just wish sometimes it'd go away a little bit faster than it does well if we're gonna be roommates or something i'll make you read like hello dollies and flesh-colored horror and then i'll just sit on the couch and wait for the tears to come and just knock uh, on and, your door and... yeah then you won't be allowed to leave the house so yeah that's all right. Yeah. And I'm fine with being a shut in where a lot of dogs and cats to yep. hang out with. Alrighty. Because the, the best way to combat horror actually is to shut yourself in further and dissociate from the world. Yeah. That's how I turned out so yeah. well. You know? It worked well. Yeah. I can tell. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, any other like sort of recommendations that maybe didn't make this list? We only had three. <laughs> so uh, any recommendation for people? who might be interested in these three or who maybe wouldn't want to read these three, but. (laughs) Well, I'm going to assume that you want to. Because, you know, some of these are honestly kind of funny, too, if you look at them in a certain light. Like, um, I don't know, um, as said before, uh, Flesh Colored Horror by Junji Ito Yo is if you just want to laugh. Honestly, it's so gross. It's so stupid gross. It's just parasites and giant fish people rotting to death on land and going wop, wop, and walking (laughs) among people with little people legs. It's ridiculous. Wait, are they mermaids with the person part on the bottom? They're basically, except they have a full fish body with little legs jutting out. And they're rotting all over the land and, like, making people sick and stuff. Are you sure Um, they're not mud skippers? I don't Isn't that know. how mud skippers work? They yeah, got I people think so. Legs? Yeah, like in they real have life? people legs and they crawl out of the mud. I yeah. saw the um, I saw the planet Earth with those that they documentary like, Rocko's yeah. Modern Life. Yeah, yeah, that one. No, wait, it was. Uh, Ren You're thinking Stimpy about Ren and Stimpy? Yeah, That's, yeah, they did. <laughs> um, but yeah, you seriously, um, Uzumaki is weird, fun body horror. Um, if you can get a copy of Museum of Terror, I think Dark Horse has it. They have the license to it. The Tomie stories are really, really fucked Um, (laughs) because largely about how you you have the beautiful characters that are good, but he has this fun way of making the the beauty into something really unnatural. He he runs into this whole obsession with hair that, again, really common in Asian horror, that hair is used in horror so much. Hmm? Um, Kirby likes Unuyasha, so she knows about Yura. The and hair. the demon hair. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, the demon hair. That's... That was a very important story because it's... it was the first one. Yep. Second one. Well, like in Japanese oh, yeah. Was hair, yeah. Or hair, spirit, and paper are all kami. 
except they're pronounced differently. It's like kami, kami, and like kami or something. So like sometimes there's these weird puns that happen with like spirit hair. That's just a weird thing that I noticed. Like lots of hair in horror stories. Um, I don't know. As, as far as things like the French comic, I've been racking my brain to think Moomins? of anything. Well, see, Moomin <laughs> is just kind and beautiful and pure in all ways as driven snow. Um, what about the Moomin's claymation show that you, is kind of gross? It's about perfect. Afterlife with Moomin's. <laughs> afterlife with Moomin's. <laughs> Unacceptable. <laughs> that is, there are some things that are just sacred. <laughs> Nobody touches Moomin and Snufkin. They're my babies. Um, gosh, as far as other horror comics, I I know there is a, a manga of The Ring, and oh, Allison yeah, that's right. from Out of the Fridge and I were trying to figure out if the manga came before the movie, and the only thing that we could find was that there was a novel before the movie, and it did not say anything about the manga and when, and then we were too dumb. The to manga, like I think, was an adaptation of the film. Yeah. I so, think. And, um, and that's kind of, we were looking at it, and that's kind of what it looked like. Um, did they do that cool thing where they take pictures of the film and put it on top of the cover uh, yeah, of the manga? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So people are like, oh, yeah, that's the book of the movie that the book no, they did happened. Not do that. It was Good. original art on the cover. I hate that crap. Oh, it's awful. Book publishers don't do that. It's awful. That's actually why I have not bought Game of Thrones. Yet. Yeah, could you not? Um, um, I was. Uh, I keep thinking of novel-related recommendations. Um, what was that the science fiction one? The I have no mouth and I cannot scream. Um, I don't know. I'm, I'm mostly going to sci-fi. I think it's that yeah. Harlan Ellison well, there, story. So there is a huge... Uh, there's a huge audience for horror manga. So if that is something that you you are interested in, even though we are currently blanking on names, a quick Google search or trip to your local comic book shop will turn up plenty. Oh! Of recommendations. I got movie ones. I throw you some movie ones just because there's so many that are yeah. good. Um, uh, Jisatsu Circle or Suicide Circle is similarly about compulsion um, to do something really horrible. The movie is kind of meh, but uh, Noriko's Dinner Table, the sequel that follows, is one of the most uncomfortable things I've ever watched in my life um coin locker baby would also be a good choice um but again that's there's some literature for you sorry for librarianing i also let the right one in is yeah there's a good foreign literature for you that's yeah. a good book the swedish <laughs> um yeah, instead of dragging it out for another half hour trying to rack our brains for recommendations, Oops. just do a, a Google search or come into your local comic book shop. I'm sure they can turn you on to some really great recommendations, especially if you like this. It's just these are kind of gateway drugs to more. Alrighty, any last thoughts? Okay, well, good night, everybody. Good night. night. Sweet dreams. Yes, sweet screams. <laughs> Thanks for listening to our show, everybody. Special thanks to theouthousers.com for posting our episodes. You can always keep up to date with everything we're doing by checking out our website at viewfromthegutters.com. You can also subscribe to our YouTube channel as we post new videos every week. You can like us on Facebook or follow us on Twitter at viewfrthgutters. And please be sure to leave us an iTunes review, as it really does help new listeners find the show. And thanks again for listening. And as always, keep reading.